never had its Nuremberg, and this is the heart of the matter. The wars of aggression waged by Russia are not characterized by victories, for it also suffered defeats, for instance, from Poland in 1920. But the wars of aggression waged by Russia are characterized by the criminality of methods and the subsequent impunity. Subsequent impunity. In the 1950s, Rafael Lemkin put forward a thesis that the Holodomor in Ukraine bears all the hallmarks of genocide. For a long decades, Lemkin's opinion was questioned or ignored in the West. As a too controversial or suggesting dangerous parallel between the Soviet communism and the Nazism, or revisionist. These attitudes prevailed for a long time also in Germany, which has only recently recognized the Holodomor as a genocide. Thus, the contemporary Russian aggression is changing not only our present, but also our assessment of the past. The links in the chain of Russian crimes and impunity must be broken. If Russia's genocidal warfare goes unpunished, international law will be in ruins. And if Putin succeeds with his attack against Ukraine, this war may turn out as an interlude to a next, even bigger war between Russia and the West. But compared to our Eastern policy in the previous era, Germany has moved dramatically over the last year. From our special relationship with Russia and no delivery of weapons to Ukraine at all, to one of the biggest suppliers of military equipment for the Ukrainian army, including the last decision on Leopard battle tanks. From a domestic perspective, this is a dramatic shift that should be acknowledged. But compared to the massivity of Russia's war of destruction and Ukraine's desperate struggle to survive, Germany's policy still seems to follow the pattern of too little too late. Paragraph four of Article 15 of the Russian Constitution states the universally recognized norms of international law and the international treaties and agreements of the Russian Federation shall be a component part of the country's legal system. If an international treaty or agreement of the Russian Federation fixes rules other than those envisaged by law. The rules of the international agreement shall be applied. That's, a, that's an interesting com, uh, concept in which international legal documents take precedence over uh, or international legal obligations that the Russian Federation has assumed are supposed to take precedence over domestic law because the, the, uh, in the Putin era that uh, has been reversed, that anything that is in contradiction with, or at least at odds with, domestic law uh, is not, is simply disregarded. So in principle, that formulation establishes the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols, the two additional protocols as Russian law. And I keep on mentioning the additional protocols because additional protocol two is directly relevant to the war in Chechnya, which, which the four original Geneva Protocols were not. So conclusions then of this, and where I'll end, um, would be the brutality of Russia's military operations during these various periods. Um, and it, it, it's the same is true of the Soviet operations, especially in Afghanistan. Um, the brutality, and, and even more during the Second World War, uh, the brutality of Russia's military operations stem not so much from a lack of awareness of the norms of hu international humanitarian law is from a lack of willingness to comply with them regardless of the country's supposed commitment to uphold them. So Russia does, the Russian Federation does have all of those obligations that it has taken on, but it also has demonstrated that it has no willingness 
to comply with them. Um, policymakers in Moscow may have pledged their acceptance of humanitarian principles by signing and ratifying international treaties, but when faced with the exigencies of armed conflict, they simply ignored their commitments and gave the Russian army a free hand. And again, all of that has been repeated over the past year. Um, there are parallels with all of these conflicts. Um, and uh, for me, it wasn't surprising. I would like probably um, add a few points speaking from Ukrainian perspective. And uh, the first point I would like to make is that um, the Russian crimes um, we're observing today uh, are instruments of a bigger picture, of a bigger story, of a story which for Ukraine has been lasting for some hundreds of years. And uh, um, this is a story of Russian imperialism, uh, which denied uh, Ukraine's actorness, uh, denied Ukraine's separate language, identity, and of course its right to have a sovereign state. And so the, the fact that Russia never was brought to responsibility and never recognized uh, its responsibility like Germany did, for instance, uh, leads to new crimes, to new aggression. And the one we observe now is exactly the result of that uh, inability to accept responsibility and uh, inability of international law to punish. Let me um, now move to the, to the big issue, the, maybe the most interesting and the most important one is the, the crime of aggression. Uh, I have sort of three thoughts about the crime of aggression that I'd like to explore briefly in these remarks. The first one uh, is, is not focused on international criminal law, but on international human rights law. And we've already had some references to the possible contributions of bodies like the European Court of Human Rights. There's something that's cooking in international human rights law that's very interesting and is very relevant to the charge of aggression uh, by Russia against Ukraine. The um, human rights institutions and communities are starting to look at aggressive war as a violation of fundamental human rights. And, and that has been more or less off limits for many, many years. Uh, the Human Rights Council, the main human rights body, uh, political body, subordinate to the General Assembly in the United Nations, has, until recently, never made a statement about aggression. The idea being that that's not a matter for that council. It's a matter for the other council. And we've heard a bit about the other council. Uh, earlier today as well, the Security Council, that that's a monopoly of the Security Council and that human rights issues don't intrude on that issue that belongs to the Security Council. But at the beginning of March of 2022, in its first resolution dealing with the situation in Ukraine, the Human Rights Council talked about the war of aggression. I believe it's the first time that we've ever had that either from the Human Rights Council or from its predecessor, the Commission on Human Rights, which was replaced by the Human Rights Council in 2006. So this is, this is a, a contribution, and we've seen a few reflections of this elsewhere. One of the interesting changes was that one of the big human rights organizations, Amnesty International, has switched its view on aggressive war. In its first statement, Amnesty, in their first statements, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch 25th of February of 2022, condemned the war crimes that were being committed, said this is a terrible war, and we warned both sides, watch it. Respect the law, don't kill people unnecessarily, et cetera, et cetera. But three days later, Amnesty International issued another statement, and it condemned the invasion as an act of aggression. It created some turmoil, it's still, there's still turmoil, inside Amnesty International about this, but I think it also is a sign of this uh, development, of this direction of travel in international human rights law, which is important and significant. You might recognize the uniforms, this very distinctive red beret and red top, and these guys seem to be popping up everywhere nowadays. PR photo shoots with Medvedev, Putin, Lavrov is possibly still on a tour of Africa, but last week he certainly was. And he took a group of 
youth army kids with him for photo ops in, in various places. But I think this group is more than a PR operation. It goes deeper than simply a group that Russian children are being forced to join. It goes deeper than groups that we've seen before, like Nashi is the one that everybody knows, which really were designed just as sort of um, groups of nationalist thugs to be deployed on key days to make splashes in the media. And currently, the last figure that I could find was November, and that was they now have 1.29 million members. That's a growth of just over 25% year on year. They seem to be growing faster and faster, and the state plans to have 20% of the school-age population joining the youth army by, I believe, 2030. From the perspective of international humanitarian law, the um, goal of the war is never simple killings, uh, never just destruction. Even if uh, the combatant is a legal uh, objective, uh, the goal of the war is not to kill the combatant, to kill as many combatants as possible, not even mentioning uh, civilians, because of course direct attacks against civilians are completely forbidden, and uh, air strikes, attacks against uh, any other uh, objective than just military one uh, are forbidden. Um, but unfortunately, when we observe uh, what's going on in Ukraine, we can see that attacking civilian objectives uh, have a systemic nature. Uh, I mean, the scale of what's going on, uh, not individual soldiers are engaged in those kind of practices, but uh, sometimes war units. Um, a strikes often appear to be recklessly uh, indiscriminative uh, and included uh, the use of indiscriminate weapons such as cluster munition, incendiary weapons. Of course, Russia is not a party to, for example, cluster munition treaty, uh, but it doesn't mean that it can use uh, that kind of weapon, uh, which is unproportional in the residential areas. Um, also, artillery attacks in uh, shelling, uh, sometimes mixture of dif different uh, methods, uh, tools um, uh, on the, uh, against residential areas, uh, doubt a lot of um, uh, doubts. Uh, then the scale of attacks against vital infrastructure. Uh, every time, it doesn't mean that, for example, electric plant cannot be a military objective, but every time it should be analyzed in the context of the definition of military objective, which uh, there is in this additional protocol number one, uh, which um, requests to take into account uh, inter alia the nature, the location, the purpose, use, etc., etc., when there is uh, the decision about the attack. Uh, destruction and size of necessities in the grain, um, so attacking objectives which could be which are indispensable sometimes for, for the population to survive. Uh, stealing grain, stealing food, um, like it, um, it is just a part, a part of uh, the war. And of course, attacking humanitarian aid, uh, something could be observed in Syria, uh, that Russia as a permanent member of the Security Council blocked the resolution uh, supporting humanitarian aid, and then physically also uh, tried to blockade, uh, used uh, the question of humanitarian aid as an instrument, uh, we uh, also unfortunately observe in, in Ukraine.